Oh my god. <laughs> that was terrifying. This is Kevin. And this is Kate. Welcome to Horror Pod. Oh my god. to do this <laughs> i mean it's kind of amazing i didn't even see you do that i didn't see mm-hmm. you prepare that they so go in real quick oh my god so kevin just <laughs> i was like cueing him for the intro and i was like okay you ready and he's like yeah and he opens his mouth and he has like huge vampire dracula teeth. vampire teeth and it was so scary <laughs> her face i didn't expect it yes i was like what just happened i did it <laughs> You were like closing the door and I was like, <laughs> like sticking them in my mouth. I had no idea. Oh my God. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, we've got two new Patronians. Patronians. Uh, first we have. Alien Shape. Hey, Alien Shape. I freaking love the name. I love that so much. Uh, thanks so much for signing up. We appreciate your support so much. Mm-hmm. And then we also have. Liv. Liv Bork, uh, who lives in Australia. We love it. That's um we love an Aussie around Absolutely. here, and we so appreciate you guys. Uh, we truly, and I say this every time, but we truly could not do the podcast without you. Absolutely. We love you. So thank you. Thank you so much for the support. Should we talk about Pop-con. our- Popcorn. <laughs> yeah, we totally should. I Absolutely. So if you saw the Instagram stories we posted, <laughs> we- we were, we found out we were a top three finalist mm-hmm. uh, for the PopCon Podcast Awards, which mm-hmm. is super exciting. And it was in Indianapolis, which is like just a bit of a drive for us, but like doable. Doable, yeah. And so we're like, let's go. Let's do it. And it's an excuse to like get, get dressy out of town. and like. Kate looked amazing. I have been waiting for that shirt to go on sale for months at Anthropology. Yeah. So when it finally did, I snatched you that snatched sucker it. up. Then I was like, where the fuck am I ever going to wear a, sque- a sequined, sparkly shirt? Loved it. You found the perfect occasion. Thank you. You looked amazing. Thank you. I, I'm i sorry that you had to hold your pee for so long. Kate, you know, I'm past it. Okay. It's okay. I thought about it again this morning. I felt so bad. <laughs> I was just like mind over matter. Like it smelled when we drove through that horrible it farm did. area. It did. It's, every time I drive that route. I was like, hey, can we stop at a rest stop? And you're like, um, yeah, sure. Like we were just passing one and well it was a welcome, a welcome center, center and i was like oh i think that's the, that's the that's the indiana welcome center right and didn't dawn on me that they probably have a public Maybe, restroom probably. but that's okay but the thing <laughs> is like it said like rest stops x here yeah. like more were coming but then they were all closed, were closed. <laughs> i felt so bad but we, we found a starbucks kate got a mocha i peed my life out it felt so bad it felt so good <laughs> when i got to the starbucks no it's okay who cares we've all had to pee every day full stop <laughs> <laughs> um no it was really fun we went fun. to the convention center and uh we walked into the room before our thing had started and we were in the wrong panel and it was like and they were like you don't have a badge get out they were like what are you doing here and it was like everyone dressed in like anime anime. yeah um and so yeah we didn't win if you did not we didn't win stories but it was cool to go it was really fun to go and the indiana convention center is a beautiful and also massive i had to walk in those freaking boots for a very long time (laughs) Yeah, it was quite a walk from the room to the car. Yes. Hello. Uh, but it was awesome. So uh, shout out to PopCon. Thanks for having yeah, us. Yeah, thank you, PopCon. Thanks for nominating us. Yeah. And uh, with that said, let's get into let's it. Let's get into it today. Well, Kate, as and listeners, as you can... <laughs> I just remembered. The other people are Right. <laughs> it's all of you. We hear you. We, we hear see you. you. We see you. We're creeping into your ear holes. Mm-hmm. I saw an opera last night uh, about- a... What? No, just I know. Like... I'm sorry, but it just made me think. I, it was about a young girl who could hear inanimate objects talk 
oh. her. But they were singing, of course, in opera. Sure. I don't want to spoil it. It was good. Okay. It was fun. Great. But it made me think, we're all listening and hearing everything. Ooh. Ooh-wee. <laughs> um, so as the vampire teeth might have given away today, Kate, <laughs> we're talking about Dracula. Mm. Um, more specifically, Bron Castle, which is also known as Castle Dracula. Oh, okay. So I know we talk about hauntings on Horrorwood. We talk about th- haunted theaters and places of entertainment. But today, listeners, we're venturing back to Europe. Oh. Romania, mm. specifically, to explore the infamous Bron Castle, also known as Castle Dracula, which I just said, but a haunted castle. I love a haunted castle. I love a haunted castle, too. We're going to talk about the history of Bron Castle, Vlad the Impaler, Bram Stoker's Dracula, hauntings, its use in movies, and most important of all, we're debunking a big myth. Ooh. Maybe bigger than the myth of Dracula himself. Oh. Is Braun actually Dracula's castle? So grab your crucifixes. Oh. <laughs> and let's head over to Transylvania and into Braun Castle. Okay, I loved that introduction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for it. Yes, yes. Now we're going <laughs> to... So... This is a this is craziness. There's so much stuff in here. It's all very interesting. I'm going to talk about the history a lot. Okay. Because I, well, I'll get into it. I want to start by saying that Brown Castle still stands. Okay. And you can visit it. Mm. It's now a museum. And I took a ton of information that I'm going to give you directly from the history section of that website. Awesome. Check it out. It's super cool. All right, let's take this shit back to the 13th century. <laughs> let's do it. As I go through this, feel free to ask questions. I may not know the answer because it's the Ottoman Empire. Okay. And that itself is, you know. You don't know everything there is to know about you the know, Ottoman I Empire? I tried to cram before coming over here, but, <laughs> you know, no. Jeez, Kevin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, in 1211... The Teutonic Knights, officially known as the Ordo Domus Mariae Sancte Teutonicorum Hero Solomonimentorum, a Catholic religious order. That, did that sound like a spell? I did. I thought it was someone's name. I'm so confused. It's a. It's I mean, an order of knights. I mean, I'm not confused. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just. I'm here. I'm ready. That was their like you know, ordained thing or something. Uh, They were a Catholic religious order formed in Palestine by German crusaders. All right. Uh, They were granted Tara Barsai, known as Terra Borza, or Burzenland, by King Andrew II of Hungary. This was land. Got it. King of Hungary was like, here's some land. It's in Transylvania. Do with it what you will. Do what you need to. You're expanding. We're moving. We're pushing through Europe. We're moving. We're grooving. Mm -hmm. And this land and the region was named after the Cuman tribe of Bursi. That'll come into play later. Okay. In the same year, 1211, the Teutonic Knights settled in the region with the intention of establishing a presence and defending the southeastern border of Transylvania from the Cumans and the Pachenigs. We're talking a land war, Kate. We're talking like people coming from one side, people coming from the other. We want this land. Yeah. And the knights were like, bitch, this is ours. Yeah. Get the fuck out whoever the cumins and the pachinanings were. I just think cumin, I think seasoning, I think. Mm, That's exactly what it was. Indian They food. were spice Give farmers. <laughs> not really. Don't take that. Away. That's not true. Okay. Um, so by 1226, the Teutonic Knights had constructed a fortress in Braun. Mm. A location whose name derives from Slavonic, meaning gate. Okay. However, their control over the area was short-lived as they were expelled from Braun in that same year, 1226. (laughs) So they came in, they were like, we built a fortress, and then they were like, they pushed them directly out immediately. Great. Well, immediately in, you know, 20 years, 15 years. But on November 19th, in the year 1377... The office of Hungarian King Louis the Great, also known as Louis I of Anjou, issued a significant document. The document granted the people of Brasov, known as Kronstadt, or the Crown's City, Mm. a privilege. The authorization to construct a castle. 
The beneficiaries of this privilege were the Saxons of Transylvania, a population of German origin people, um, also from Luxembourg, okay. who migrated to Transylvania during the 12th century. Got it. So they were mostly like German people living in Romania. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is like the construction of like Romanian society. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Yeah. Nationality. Specifically, those from the region encompassing Brasov were urged to participate in the construction of Braun Castle. I would imagine. They were like, can you help us? They were like, God, (laughs) get over here and build this shit for us and with us. I also want to point out that Transylvania is a Latin word that means on the other side of the woods or across the woods. I didn't know that. I didn't That's cool. This is fitting because it's located in the southern, Braun Castle specifically, is uh, located in the southern Carpathian mountain range of Romania. So this is a okay. very wooded area. Gotcha. In the mountains. Like you're into the woods hoodie. Into the woods. Into the woods. Transylvania edition. Braun Castle was the des- oh did I just say that Braun Castle was the designated name for their fortress. Okay. Uh, originally named Dietrichstein or Turzburg in mm. German. Oh, and Turksvar in Hungarian and Tirku in Romanian. Take all of that with a grain of salt. I watched so many pronunciation videos. You sound Kate. great saying <laughs> those words. I have. There's many, many more. You got it. I practice these. We're ready. Yeah. This decree marked a pivotal moment in the castle's history, establishing its purpose and initiating that construction. So this is, you know, the the knights came in and built like a fort, but Mm -hmm. now this castle is like the real deal fortress. Gotcha. In the year 1388, the construction of the castle reached its completion. Perched atop a steep cliff between Magura and Delu... Sati. Fortified Towns Hill is what that means. Okay. <laughs> uh, I could have just said that. The, <laughs> the castle boasted an unparalleled vantage point. It's high up there. I'm sure, it's yeah. It's gorgeous, offering breathtaking views of the surrounding hills, including the uh, Mosu Valley and Valea Barsai. So functioning as both a customs post and a fortress, mm-hmm. Braun Castle played a crucial role in the region. It facilitated trade by overseeing 3% of goods entering and exiting Transylvania, okay. ensuring the smooth flow of commerce. Additionally, strategically positioned at the eastern border of Transylvania, the castle served as a bulwark against the expansionist ambitions of the Ottoman Empire, meaning it was like a like a place that was, you know, defending that border. Sure. So the castle's inhabitants comprised professional soldiers, mercenaries, and even notable figures like the storyteller Ioan de Tarnava. In his writings, Tarnava documented encounters with, quote, the English brigades and Belista soldiers of the 15th century, shedding light on the castle's dynamic and diverse population. It was kind of becoming like this mishmash of European people. Okay. And we see it kind of later on, especially like in the early 1900s, as like, there's a queen of Romania we'll get to. She's amazing. But she was English, like descended from oh, Queen Victoria. Okay. So it was like the monarchy was sort of like spread more across Europe, I think, mm-hmm. than it was than it is now. Mm-hmm. Anywho, the lordship of Braun Castle was a position of considerable importance. It was a big fucking deal. Yeah. Uh, typically bestowed upon individuals of Saxon descent by the king. The I mean, German I feel descent. like if you're a lordship of a castle, like... You're it a hot shit. Yeah, it doesn't get much bigger <laughs> than that. It doesn't get better than that. You're like, I made it to the top, <laughs> exactly. literally, of that mountain. <laughs> Over time, the role of Lord became increasingly significant in the annals of Transylvania history. And by the late 15th century, the castle's commander held the prestigious title of Vice Vovode of Transylvania, a fancy name for a leader. Sure. Like It's like president, basically. Okay. When I tried to look it up, it's just like, yeah, someone at the top of the game. Vice Vovoide. <laughs> Vice Vovoide. Uh, <laughs> or it says, or it's Vice Vovoide. But I want to say Vice. You know what? I do too. Thank and you, I'm going to start calling myself that. Vice Vovoide. Vice Vovoide. <laughs> what does it mean again? The top. Like, top, okay. top. <laughs> top of the game. <laughs> top of the pops. Oh. 
Ooh. Ooh. It is in a fascinating twist of medieval politics and alliances, Brancastle's fate took a dramatic turn in the year 1407. Sigismund of Luxembourg, the shrewd monarch, mm. renowned for his diplomatic maneuvers, snake, bestowed the castle as a fief, which was an estate of land. That's just a fancy word for an estate of land. Mm -hmm. um, upon his trusted ally, Prince Mercia, the elder of Wallachia. Wallachia. I know Wallachia. That sounds like a cool, so, that's a cool name. There's different ways to pronounce it. That's the actual Romanian pronunciation. The significance of this gesture lay in its strategic implications. Situated at the crossroads of empires and vulnerable to the ever-looming threat of Turkish incursions, Brancastle served as a refuge for Sigismund, providing a secure haven in the event of an Ottoman onslaught. Mm. However, with the ultimate demise of, the prin of Prince Mercia in 1419, the balance of power in Wallachia was disrupted. Political turbulence gripped the region, casting doubt upon the castle's fate, sensing an opportunity amidst the chaos. Sigismund swiftly reclaimed control of Brown Castle. I forgot to point out here that modern-day Romania, at the time the borders I don't think were as set back in medieval times, okay. but like Transylvania is kind of like a state in Romania. Mm, yeah, gotcha. And then like Wallachia is another state. In Romania. Okay. I think there's three total. I don't know the other one. I'll look it up later. Rather than keeping it under his direct authority, Sigismund made a calculated decision. Recognizing the strategic importance of Transylvania, he entrusted the castle to the princes of Transylvania, okay. cementing their allegiance to the Hungarian crown and fortifying the region's defenses against external threats. Braun Castle became not only a symbol of political intrigue, but also a bastion of Transylvanian autonomy under the watchful eye of its new guardians. So this was a big deal for the castle. Mm -hmm. In the fort in the in the fourteen forty one in, in the, the year 1441. in the fourteen forty one <laughs> in the year fourteen forty one Transylvania faced a dire threat as the Ottoman Turks launched a raid into the territory. Mm. They were like, "Here we, we come." come. However, it was John Hanyadi, also known as Yanku de Hunadwara, who emerged as the valiant defender, leading his forces to victory against the invaders at Braun. So John came in and was like, no, you're not. No, you're fucking not. While you're telling the story, the image in my head is the cast of what we do in the shadows. Yes, exactly. And that's all I can think about. That's, that's exactly what's happening. Just take <laughs> those people and put them in that castle. Got it. And they're all defending it. I see it all. And like the get out of here, Turks, Ottoman Empire, pashoof, get away. <laughs> <laughs> get away from us. Don't talk to us. As the Prince of Transylvania, Yanku understood the strategic significance of maintaining strong alliances, particularly with those Saxons mm -hmm. who resided on the border. So recognizing their pivotal role in safeguarding the region, he reaffirmed the pledges made to the people of Brasov by both Mercia the Elder and Sigismund. So he's like, no, I see what these guys were doing. Like they're, you know, making sure that these people are taken care of because these are the people who have been here pretty much like the longest yeah we want to keep them happy and keep them on our side sure. because they helped build this place yeah so by honoring these commitments yanku not only secured the vital support of the saxons but also demonstrated the unwavering dedication to the defense of transylvania he was like building not an army specifically but trust yeah, yeah. building trust <laughs> kevin just had like some really fancy hand gestures and a little dance move with that <laughs> That's Trust. What That's what I'm <laughs> so, in, okay, here we go. Oh, okay. In 1459, we see the infamous Vlad the Impaler mm. pass through Braun. So, I'm going to get into Vlad after diving into the history of this castle because he's his own okay. story, and I want to. I want you guys to know about the location before I get into Vlad because that segues directly into Dracula. Okay. Vlad's army marched through Braun. On its way to Brasov, which is basically the town that surrounds Braun, mm -hmm. or is nearby Braun, to address the dispute between the Wallachian Vivode <gasps> and the Saxons. The Saxons had demanded higher customs taxes and backed Vlad's rival for the throne at the time. Mm, okay. Yeek. Sultan, hairy. who was Sultan Mehmed II of the Ottoman Empire. 
During this campaign, Vlad the Impaler invaded the outskirts of the city and executed hundreds of Transylvanian Saxons. Sorry, that's the washer. Bonk, 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 so bonk. a little pause. I'm going to take a drink of coffee. Okay, anyway. I'll tell this All whole this story. All this history talk is making me thirsty. <laughs> uh, Frankie, my dog Frankie, has been very sick this morning and has just puked everywhere all over everything i've been washing her blankets all morning and so if you hear like a boom 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 it's just the washer and dryer going to clean up dog vomit or it's the ghost of dracula knocking on the walls oh so when vlad killed all of those saxons this brutal act incited the saxons to seek retaliation no Uh, shit yeah (laughs) they're gonna come back and be like bitch what'd you do Leading them to portray Vlad as a tyrant of extreme ruthlessness in in reports. They were like, what the fuck are you doing, you evil psycho bitch? Like Verbatim. That. Verbatim. In 1498, a pivotal moment in the castle's history occurred when the Saxons of Brasov secured their right to use Brown Castle for a decade in exchange for 1,000 florins, which was the currency at the time. Is that like a lot of money? Yeah. Okay. Uh, from King Vladislav II, Jagiello of Hungary. This marked the beginning of a period of Saxon influence over the castle's affairs. Mm -hmm. So they were able to kind of gain some control after Vlad fucking slaughtered them. As they assumed control of its revenue-generating customs during the lease. Over the centuries, Braun Castle changed hands multiple times, mm. reflecting the their you know reflecting all those political and social upheavals of the region. Uh, in 1651, the castle was sold to George Rakosi by the city of Brasov after several lease extensions. Despite these transitions, the castle remained a symbol of stability as the political and social landscape was changing around it. In 1723, the castle underwent significant renovation with completion of work on its northern tower, ensuring its continued relevance and, you know, structural integrity. Yeah, because by that time, it would have been like, what, 500 years old or something? Yeah, Yeah. so they're like, let's make some (laughs) modifications. Let's make sure it stays up there. Yeah. Time to do a little a little, a maintenance. little maintenance work. <laughs> However, the passage of time took its toll on the castle. Oh, well. Uh, with damage inflicted by sieges, neglect, and natural disasters. Well, so much for the maintenance. Yet through it all, Braun oh. Castle stood as a testament to the resilience of Romanian heritage and identity. All the right. year 1920 marked a new chapter in Braun Castle's history when, following the incorporation of Transylvania into Greater Romania, the citizens of Brasov unanimous, unanimous, oh no, unanimously, there we there go, it is. decided to offer the castle to Queen Marie of Romania, mm. who was married to King Ferdinand I of Romania. And spoiler, they were distant cousins Ooh. and descended from Queen Victoria of England. Keeping it in the family, I guess. <laughs> in the fam. I mean, I, I think he was German um, and she was English. Also, all I can think about right now because it's a queen is the Queen of the Castle the song oh. from Six. My favorite. I'm queen of the Castle. Anna of Cleves. Get down, Freaking dirty love. Oh, I love That's that That's my song. favorite song in it's that. It's so good. So, yes, cousins. Hey, cuz, under her stewardship, Braun Castle was transformed into a royal summer residence. Great. She Mate- said, I'm going to fix this yeah, up. Yeah, she came in and she's like, this is dank. Dank. And <laughs> we need to make this nice because I'm a queen, like a big one. Let me just come in here and fix Let all me, this shit. And thank God she did. Meticulously restored and renovated by architect Karen Lehman. That sounds like such a basic name. I mean, no no offense, no shade to Karen Lehman, but you've got like- It might be Lyman, L-I-M-A-N. Still. Still, Karen Lyman. <laughs> you've got like all these amazing names and queens and lords and- Ferdinand and uh, Yanku and- <laughs> And then there's Karen. And there's Karen who fixed the castle. Oh, Karen fixed the <laughs> Karen castle. Karen fixed the castle. <laughs> I want that to be the title of her biography. During Queen Marie's tenure, Braun Castle flourished as a cultural and social hub with the addition of a hydroelectric power plant, oh. an English park with ponds and a tea house, mm. and various other buildings to enhance its functionality and aesthetic appeal. 
The castle became not only a symbol of prestige, but also a reflection of Queen Marie's vision for Romania's future. Sure. Also, I love a tea house. A tea house. Well, at the end of the episode, I'll tell you something having to do with that tea house. Oh, Oh, all right. oh, Oh, However, political upheavals in the mid 20th century brought new challenges to Braun Castle. Enter communism. Here it is. Uh, in 1948, Princess Ileana, who was Queen Marie's daughter, okay. and her family were forced to leave Romania. Oh, I should have. Sm- I'm sorry. I, f- I skipped over this. Queen Marie passed away in the 1920s, I believe. Mm. Uh, and so her daughter took over. Okay. You know, not, a, I don't think as queen, because, you know, that lineage goes whatever way. Sure. <laughs> but she took over the castle. Okay. That's what's important. Her, she and her family were forced to leave Romania by the communist regime. Well, that sucks. Which marked the end of an era for the castle. And subsequently, subsequently in 1956, Braun Castle was transformed into a museum by communist authorities. Hmm. Preserving its history and heritage. I mean, that sucks, but it also like preserved the helped to well, preserve sure. the castle. So despite the turbulent events of the 20th century, Braun Castle remained a beacon of resilience and continuity. Communism in Romania ended in 1989. And in 1990, Princess Ileana revisited the castle. Oh, okay. Witnessing its transformation into a museum and reflecting on you know, the past. So her, she died in 1991. Oh, so just one year later. Well, I'm glad she got to see it. She got to see it. Yeah. She got to go back home and and see what it had become. And I think she was happy with, you know, that it was still standing and Mm -hmm. all of that. So finally, in 2009, Braun Castle returned to the possession of its legal heirs, Archduke Dominic, Archduchess Maria Magdalena, and Archduchess Elizabeth. Those were the descendants of that royal family, so it went back to them. Got it. Today, the castle continues to captivate visitors from around the world. It's a huge piece of history Mm -hmm. in Romania. And, of course, you know, an enduring legacy and royal lineage and all of that. Mm -hmm. So... That's Braun Castle. Okay. A storied past. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now we're going to get back to Vlad. Okay. Because this bitch is insane. Oh. So Vlad, as I've as we've mentioned, or as you know, is the inspiration for the fictional character of Dracula. Mm-hmm. Vlad the Third, commonly known as Vlad the Impaler, but his name was Vlad Tepish. Oh. Tepish. Okay. Number one, didn't know he was the third and did not know his name was Tepish. Tepish. I watched a Romanian guy on YouTube say that over and over again. <laughs> Tepish. You sound great. Tepish. He, of course, was the Voivode uh, <laughs> of Wallachia uh, <laughs> three times between 1448 and his death in 1476 77. Okay. Not exactly known when sure. he passed away. Uh, and he was born in 1428, between 1428 and 1431. Okay. He's regarded as one of the most significant rulers in Wallachian history and a national hero of Romania. Vlad was the son of Vlad Dracul, mm. who ascended to the Wallachian throne in 1436. During this time, Vlad and his younger brother, Radu, were taken as hostages by the Ottoman Empire Oof. in 1442 to secure their father's allegiance. They were like... Hey, Ottoman Empire, we're going to steal your kids. Or, hey, Vlad, Dracul, we're going to steal your kids because you need to be part of this. You need to support the empire. Mm. So it's like uh, a ransom kind of ransomed thing. Ransom kind of thing to make him establish political allegiance. Gotcha. Unfortunately, Vlad did have an, well, Vlad had an older brother, Marcia, and he died. Okay. He was murdered along with his oh. father, Vlad Dracul, were murdered by John Honiadi, Yanku. Who was, who was, you know, over the castle at the time. Oh. It was at this time that Vladislav II, Vlad's second cousin, was installed as the new Voivode. Okay. I know this is a lot of weird, like, his cousin, he did this, but yeah. we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into it. Okay. Um, in 1448, Vlad launched a military campaign with Ottoman support, seizing Wallachia mm. briefly before seeking refuge in the Ottoman Empire. So he went went to the place that they were trying to stay away from and who had kidnapped him and like formed allegiances with the Ottoman Empire to then take over Wallachia. Wallachia. Okay. He went to the enemy and used the enemy to take power over Wallachia. Sneaky bitch. (laughs) 
<laughs> After relations between Hungary and Vladislav deteriorated, Vlad invaded Wallachia in 1456 with Hungarian assistance, and that killed his cousin Vladislav. He killed oh, him. Oh, wow. Slaughtered him. Ooh. Vlad then initiated a purge among the Wallachian boyars, who were basically like local members of feudal nobility in okay. the town, uh, to consolidate his power. He was like, take out all the high up people. Let's get mm. them out of here. Slit, slit, slit. Well, not slit impale which Ooh. we'll get to yeah more conflict with the transylvanian saxons ensued they're just trying to do their thing mm-hmm. they've lived there for hundreds of years leading to plundering of saxon villages Ooh. and the impalement of captives oh geez earning vlad the famous moniker vlad the impaler it's he, hundreds of people wow he would, it would you would take a pole i can't remember if it was hot or not i don't think so you would just Ooh. take a sharp pole it would go in your bum. Oh. And oh. you would go all the way up through till it came out the top. Oh. And then he would stick that in the ground and they would just be impaled there. And sometimes if if it missed certain organs, they wouldn't die immediately. And so it would sometimes take days for people to die. Like some of them would still be alive, like outside on those poles, just completely impaled. Isn't that awful? I <laughs> have a lot of feelings right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that is oh like I'm my insides I know. are just feeling things yeah, 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 and yeah. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh god, that's horrible. It's horrific. I can't even imagine. Well, now it's all I can imagine. <laughs> um I don't mean to laugh at that. I'm just like, it's so horrific. And I I can't even imagine. Like, that would hurt so much. I would hope your body would kind of, your mind would, with that level of pain, help. Like kind of go into a shock shock or like dissociate or something. something. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, ugh. So in 19, or sorry, 1962. Oh, my God. In 1462, uh, he launched a brutal attack on Ottoman territory. Hmm prompting Mehmed II to retaliate by supporting Vlad's brother, Radu. Okay. I know this is a lot of weird stuff. Um, Vlad's attempt to capture Mehmed II failed because Mehmed was the the Saxon of the Ottoman Empire. Okay. He was like a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it's just interesting, of course, that like, you know, Vlad uses the Ottoman Empire to take over Wallachia, but then he's just like power hungry. Yeah. And goes after Mehmed. And Mehmed's like, okay, fine. Well, then fuck you. L- I want to, let's do stuff with your brother Radu. I'm going to use him mm. to like piss you off. Yeah. Um, Gosh, everyone, your dicks are all fine. Like, why do we chill. have to, like, Daddy, chill, it, as that like just, meme said. <laughs> it just sounds like a big dick swinging contest. It really is. It really is. Yucca. Vlad's attempt to capture Mehmed II failed leading to his imprisonment imprisonment by the king of Hungary from 1463 to 1475. Despite his incarceration, tales of Vlad's cruelty spread across Europe. I would imagine. Released in 1475, Vlad fought against the Ottomans in Bosnia before returning to Wallachia to reclaim his throne. With Hungarian and Moldavian assistance, Vlad briefly regained power, but the reign was Mm short-lived as Basarab Laota supported by the Ottomans, ousted him from Wallachia. Okay. Uh, Vlad died in battle sometime before January 10th, 1477. I think that's when there was like a record that he had died. Okay. Don't know the exact date. Yeah. During Vlad III's lifetime in the mid-15th century, stories of his brutality circulated, documented in various accounts. In 1464, a 19-line poem by Michael Beheim depicted Vlad's cruelty, alleging he impaled monks and duplicitously promised support to rival factions, which he did. Mm -hmm. By 1475, Bishop Gabriele Rangoni and historian Antonio Bonfini recorded further anecdotes of Vlad's cruelty, including gruesome acts like boiling people alive and impaling women with their babies. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. German and Slavic stories portrayed him as a sadistic tyrant with woodcut illustrations enhancing the tale's macabre allure. These stories, likely exaggerated or even invented, became early bestsellers in Europe. I think, so we know the impaling thing. Mm -hmm. I don't, the rest of it, people glommed onto 
that and then I think maybe it can get exaggerated it, uh, yeah over time I think it got a little bit exaggerated okay I mean I don't know why we need to exaggerate on impaling that feels I mean that's pretty... fine but I feel like <laughs> if you go that route anything else is just like par for the course I mean that's <laughs> what I'm saying like do we need to expound on that I think think that covers it I think that's it use your imaginations mm. he certainly did Ooh. Ugh. But these tales became like bestsellers in Europe. It was like, oh, I'm weird. Ew. Yeah. Spreading through printed books adorned with horrifying imagery. Sure. You can find some of those images and stuff. Vlad's notoriety continued in Slavic tales, sort of mixing fact and fiction uh, to portray him as both brutal and effective in centralizing power. I would say so. <laughs> Modern assessments suggest Vlad's actions would constitute war crimes and genocide by today's mm, standards. Yeah. But I mean, that's kind of where the fascination, like the horrific fascination around him comes from mm -hmm. is because of all the shit that he did. But he was also like an effective leader. Effective in, you know. And that everyone was terrified everyone of him. <laughs> Yikes. So yeah, he became one of Europe's most renowned medieval rulers in, mm -hmm. in Romanian history. However, it was Bram Stoker's nineteen or sorry, eighteen ninety seven novel, Dracula. I love the way you say that. Thank you. Dracula. <laughs> that first intertwined Vlad with vampirism. Stoker drew inspiration from Emily Gerard's 1885 article on Transylvanian superstitions. While his historical insights into Wallachia were gleaned from William Wilkinson's 1820 book, account of the principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia with political observations relative to them. That was the title. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> Getting paid by the word. Exactly. Contrary to popular belief... Stoker's knowledge of Vlad was minimal. Oh, okay. Stoker's portrayal of Dracula's Sezekli origin, which is Hungarian subgroup living in Romania, oh, okay. which is essentially Vlad's like nationality, mm -hmm. stemmed from his familiarity with Attila the Hun's campaigns and the supposed Hunnic connection of the Zek. Zeklis, Zeklis, Hungarian people. Stoker's early drafts of Dracula lacked any mention of the historical figure. Instead, hmm. Stoker borrowed Vlad's name and fragments of Wallachian history to shape his iconic vampire narrative. All right. Here's the myth debunking. Bron Castle wasn't exactly ever owned and visited by Vlad. Oh. But its description was the inspiration for Castle Dracula. Oh, okay. So it w Vlad was never the that he might have been there once mm. uh, as a prisoner for a short period of time. Oh, okay, that's not confirmed anywhere in like physical history. Gotcha. Might have stopped by and been might imprisoned. Not have. Might not have. So it's not really. I mean, that connection is solely to the fictional story of Dracula. Okay. The physical description of. Yeah, the physical description of Bron Castle is what is in the book mm -hmm. for Dracula's castle. The name of Vlad's castle was like, I think it's Panori, um, but it's in disrepair. And I think I looked it up and you you could visit it, but they're currently rebuffing it. I see. Another castle for another time. <laughs> okay. In the villages surrounding Bron, a belief in malevolent spirits known as ghosts or stragoi persists. Until... I like that you're like known as ghosts. <laughs> ghosts. No, the Strogoi. Until recently, locals held that certain individuals, known as Strogoi, lived ordinary lives by day, but roamed the village at night in spirit form. Oh. Haunting and tormenting sleepers. Oh. This nocturnal affliction lasted until the break of dawn when their power waned. They are said to gain vitality through blood of their victims. So this is where we get vampirism, mm -hmm. the, the Strogoi, mm -hmm. uh, the legend of those ghosts. Stoker eloquently captures this notion of eternal torment in his writings, noting how these undead beings perpetuate evil throughout the ages. It's from these chilling local tales that the character of Dracula emerges. Okay. All right. Now that we're through the Dra Dracula yes. part, let's move on to some spooky encounters Alrighty. and reported hauntings Alrighty. at Bron Castle. At the heart of the local lore of Bron Castle lies the spectral, spectral presence of Queen Marie. Our girl! Mm -hmm, whose deep connection to the castle persists beyond her earthly life. I was reading about Queen Marie in preparation for this, and 
She seemed like a cool, like, down-to-earth lady. Mm -hmm. Like, she was super nice. There are reports of her, um, like, organizing orgies at the castle. Oh, okay. Like, during the war when her husband was gone. Shit. And apparently, like, she and um, Ferdinand did not get along very well. And Mm. it took them a while to, like, even become friends. So it doesn't sound like they had much of a full romantic relationship it was like strictly business so she was like when the cat's away yeah this bitch go play yeah yeah with Uh, a lot of other people (laughs) allegedly allegedly (laughs) (laughs) i don't want to like besmirch someone's name but i think that sounds amazing and queen marie we're here for you girl yeah she has there's an auto she wrote an autobiography oh i kind of want to read it yeah um, Is it called, I'm the queen of the castle? <laughs> get, get down. down. In sub quotes, get it down, dirteth rascals. <laughs> Reports of Queen Marie's ghostly apparition wandering the corridors and chambers she once graced are plentiful. Mm-hmm. She's around. Witnesses describe fleeting glimpses of a regal figure adorned in period attire, her ethereal form shimmering in the moonlight. Mm. Some claim to have felt a gentle touch or heard the soft echo of her footsteps, evoking an eerie sense of her lingering presence. Beyond the Queen's ghost, Braun Castle is a hot spot for inexplicable phenomena. Ooh. Visitors and paranormal enthusiasts alike recount encounters with orbs of light dancing through the air, casting an otherworldly glow upon the ancient walls. Shadowy figures are said to dart across dimly lit passages, their presence felt rather than seen, sending shivers down the spines of those who dare to explore. Possessions, <laughs> though rare, mm. have been documented within the castle's confines. Is your hand okay? Yeah, I just it cramped up. Oh, second. okay. <laughs> Possessions. <laughs> I was like, st- <laughs> it's a weird moment for that to happen. <laughs> Kevin just started like my randomly shaking, shaking one hand. hand and I was like, oh God, what's happening over there? Visitors reported sudden changes in demeanor and behavior of people mm. while in the castle. Interesting. Electronic voice phenomena captured through audio recordings offer tantalizing glimpses into the spirit realm with disembodied voices communicating messages from the beyond oh poltergeist activity adds another layer of intensity to the castle's hauntings with objects inexplicably moving or levitating i would like to see that Mm. seemingly under the influence of unseen forces Mm -hmm. the air crackles with energy charged with the presence of the unknown as visitors tread carefully through the hallway hallowed halls of Braun castle While some speculate about the involvement of Vlad Tepish, historical evidence linking him to the castle is scarce, of course. It's said but not proven that Vlad was held prisoner, which I already said. The castle certainly attracts a lot of paranormal enthusiasts and ghost hunters. Mm. Peggy McGuire. Peggy McGuire. (laughs) A seasoned ghost hunter from Tampa embarked on an extraordinary paranormal investigation at Braun Castle. This endeavor was part of the world's largest ghost hunt. Oh, wow. Uh, an event aimed at raising public awareness about paranormal investigations. Hmm. McGuire's involvement in two previous world's largest ghost hunt events. Well, how many world's largest can there be? I think there's one every year. If it's the world's largest, what is the next one even bigger and then the next one's even bigger? I don't know, Kate. I'll look into it. Thank you. I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. You can text me later. I will. will. (laughs) So she went to Braun Castle. Peggy did. Peggy from Tampa. Peggy McGuire. uh, Leading a four-person team comprising investigators from across Florida, McGuire's group possessed an array of specialized equipment including spirit boxes and dousing rods. Yeah, you got to have all the things. You got to have the mechanics. If you're going to be in the world's largest (laughs) ghost hunting, you better have the equipment. Uh, Kate, I need you to make a video about this and send this to the, we're going to send it to the world's largest ghost hunt. But which one? (laughs) I think it's a collection of ghost hunts. All right. You know, I'm not going to speak on it because I don't know. Because you weren't part of it. I wasn't part of it. Largest ghost hunt. <laughs> I wasn't invited. No. Nope. Right. So she was like, going here, going to look for ghosts. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. They did a six hour investigation. McGuire's team experienced several intriguing encounters. As they explored the castle's dimly lit corridors and shadowy chambers, they claimed to sense sadness and grief. Hmm. Armed with dousing rods, McGuire initiated a series of yes or no questions, inviting the spirits to communicate. 
the most compelling moment occurred in the castle's ominous torture chamber. Well, duh. (laughs) Filled with chilling relics dating back to the 1400s. With dowsing rods in hands, Maguire posed questions to the purported spirit of Vlad Vlad Tepish. Is Tepish there? She asked. To which the rods allegedly responded affirmatively. Yes. Okay. Even though he never lived there. Maybe. Okay. Not lived. Maybe was prisoner there. Ah. Or stopped by. (laughs) Seeking further insight into Tepish's connection to the castle, Maguire inquired whether he had been imprisoned there, Mm -hmm. prompting the rods to just start spinning rapidly. What does that mean? Not yes or no. Oh. Subsequent queries suggested that Tepish had indeed been held captive within the castle's walls. So they gleaned from that that he had been there. Okay. And was imprisoned there at some point. Hmm. That's what the ghosts say. But also like any go- like any ghost in there too would have known about Vlad Tepish and all the shit that he did. So like bringing him up would probably piss off any like 14th, sure. 15th century ghost at Braun Castle. Reflecting on the encounter... Maguire cautiously acknowledged the possibility that they had communicated with Tepish's ghost. Quote, I think it's a good possibility. Yes, she remarked, (laughs) underscoring the profound nature of their experience. (laughs) I needed to include that. I had to. I read this whole article. Yes. Yes. (laughs) It was a big article in a Tampa newspaper. The investigation, that ghost hunt investigation was live streamed to audiences worldwide. Oh. McGuire remains uh, steadfast in her belief that the exploration may have uncovered a link to Vlad, one of history's most enduring legends. Since July 2020, visitors to Braun Castle have been invited to delve into the mysterious realm of nighttime creatures. Mm. Ascending to the fourth floor... Intrepid souls encounter an exhibition titled A History of Dread A History of Dreads in Transylvania. Scary stuff. Yeah. Curated by Mrs. Antoinetta Oltianu, a professor at the University of Bucharest. This immersive experience explores the origins and significance of local myths and fears, tracing their evolution from ancient folklore to their portrayal in the writings of Bram Stoker. Stoker. Mm -hmm. I once went to a library when I was a teenager in West Virginia and asked to get Dracula, the book. Uh And they were like, who's the author? And I was like, Bram Stoker. And then the lady, I think, misheard me because she took me to the aisle and she was like, hum, let me find it. Stroker. Stroker. No. And I was like, uh, Stoker. And she's a librarian. Mm-hmm. This society. Stroker. Within the confines of Braun Castle's ancient walls, seven fundamental characters of Transylvanian folklore, Transylvanian folklore are unveiled for the first time. From the Grim Reaper to werewolves, these spectral beings emerge to recount their tales of terror, uh, shedding light on special powers, and enduring hold on the imagination mm. of mortals. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of exhibits of Romanian yeah. uh, mythology at the castle, which is pretty cool, mm-hmm. considering Bram Stoker catapulted Braun Castle sort sure. of directly into the superstitious and paranormal. Mm-hmm. But also while realizing that the local areas in Romania had a lot of myth and folklore going on, going on, especially with like the Strugoi. The what? The str- Oh, the, the ghosts. The yeah. ghost vampires. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, the what? The what? <laughs> <laughs> Stromboli. Um, from English romantic literature to Hollywood horror films, the exhibition traces the evolution of Count Dracula's character and his enduring association with Brown Castle. There's a Dracula exhibition there too. I mean, I would assume. Of course, there would. Be. Can you imagine if, like, that's the one thing they did? They have? didn't have. Um, it's actually pretty cool. But the history of the Dreads in Transylvania section is integrated as a permanent exhibition there. Okay. So it's not like something that'll come and go. There's also a thing called the Time Tunnel, which is a spectacular like multi multimedia show, oh. um, and it. It's an exhibition that brings to life narratives of the historical figures and the mythical creatures. Okay. So that sort of intersection there. Yeah. And it's like a blend of history and folklore. Apparently, it's like a really cool thing to watch and look at. Oh, cool. So, of course, we talked about the historical elements of Dracula. 
But the legend has been huge, of course, since Stoker's book came out. Mm -hmm. Several movies, several movies Mm -hmm. have been made. So let's talk a little bit about Dracula in film. Great. In the realm of cinematic history, Dracula's evolution and adaptation, you know, mirror that fascination with the undead count. Uh, The narrative journey begins with F.W. Murnau's silent masterpiece Nosferatu Mm -hmm. in 1922, a film that sparked the legacy of cinematic Dracula. Preceding this, Bram Stoker himself staged a play adaptation of Dracula, uh, showcasing his character's early impact in 1897, albeit met with lukewarm reception. Okay. Despite being lost... uh, Caroli Lafier's 1921 film Dracula's Death mm. marks another significant chapter in early Dracula cinema. Dracula, the character, was portrayed by iconic character, or, sorry, iconic actors like Bela Lugosi and Christopher sure. Lee, shaping the Count's image for generations. Lugosi's haunting rendition in Universal Studios 1931, Dracula, set a standard Mm -hmm. for that character, imprinting Dracula's speech and mannerisms into popular consciousness. You're really good at that voice. Thank you. Meanwhile, Christopher Lee's embodiment in Hammer Films' 1958 adaptation, Hammer Films' 1958 adaptation, reinvigorated the character, captivating audiences through a series of sequels. So we have the original Universal movie monster mm. and then Hammer Horror also sort of threw out okay. a bunch of, of popular Dracula movies. In the realm of adaptations, Francis Ford Coppola's oh. 1992 film Bram Stoker's Dracula presents a curious blend of fidelity to the source material and creative liberties. <laughs> Despite its perplexing narrative choices, the film is kind of a technical marvel. Have you seen it? 1992 I'm Dracula? I'm trying to think. It's I, ridiculous. I don't think I have seen that one. It's so, it's... um. If I have, I don't remember. It's Gary it. Oldman playing okay. Dracula, and then Keanu Reeves playing Jonathan Harker, and then um, Winona Ryder playing Mina. Okay. And I forget the char- the actress who plays Lucy, but she's so good. Her and Gary Oldman, I feel like, are the best of that movie. Mm. It's... So campy, though. Yeah. Like, camp out the wazoo. Sure. <laughs> Just his hair's in, like, these weird white buns. <laughs> wow. I'll show it to you after we're done recording. Okay. But no, there's that was, like, a really popular one just because it was so batty. Additionally, the emergence of black exploitation cinema gave rise to Blackula in 1972, oh, okay. um, offering a unique spin on the Dracula mythos. Also another wackadoo (laughs) crazy movie that I am obsessed with. Go watch it. Beyond traditional adaptations, Dracula still permeates popular culture, appearing in various guises across film and television, from comedic parodies like Dracula Dead and Loving It, to modern interpretations like Dracula 2000. I think I was telling you about that yesterday. Dracula 2000, 2000. like I was obsessed with the metal soundtrack. And it had Gerard Butler and Vitamin C. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So good. Dracula's legacy s- continues to evolve. The, you know, there's television series like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which are amazing and I was obsessed with for the longest <laughs> time. I love vampire stuff. All right. You you love vampire stuff? I love it. You who just uh, happen uh, to have uh, a, uh, pair a pair of vampire, vampire teeth, teeth in, in your house. pocket? <laughs> <laughs> I carry them everywhere. <laughs> Instead of pepper spray, I have my vampire teeth. Yep. <laughs> so when you visit Braun Castle, you're also treated to an exhibition of famous movies mm-hmm. about Dracula, with that Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula earning a notable mention. Okay. And surprisingly, the tour also unveils authentic props from the film. Oh, that's cool. Um, accompanied by letters of authenticity. So while Coppola didn't film at Braun Castle, it mm. does... Uh, it's part in, you know, the vampire mythos, linking yeah. it to Vlad the Impaler, the legendary Dracula. Embracing this playful myth adds a delightful twist to the castle visit. Who knows? You might even leave questioning your newfound affinity for the night. Didn't you say that um, stuff had been filmed there, though? Oh, I'll get to it. Oh, okay. Okay. Celebrities also visit Bran- Bran Castle. In 2016, Johnny Depp accompanied... <laughs> By his band, the Hollywood oh, Vampires, yeah. embarked on the next leg of a, his Romanian adventure. Their destination was Braun Castle. That's yeah. cool. 
w- yeah, Johnny Depp and his band went there. And he went with bandmates Alice Cooper and Joe Perry and Tim Burton. Awesome. They all went to Braun to check it out. They pose for photos. You can look this up online. They pose for photos in front of the castle. And in a playful moment, Depp indulged in a bit of theatrics and amusingly was pretending to bite one of the production assistants. Of course. Yeah. I do like me some Johnny Depp. I know. I do too. Castle Dracula has, Braun Castle, has served as a filming location for several movies over the years, including 1974's Old Dracula, Werner Herzog's Nosferatu the Vampire, Mm. not to be confused with the original 1922 Nosferatu, Gargoyle from 2004, and Dracula 2012. Images of the castle appear in numerous horror movies. I can't list all of them. Cool. But like people use that castle as like a symbol Mm -hmm. of Dracula, essentially. Okay, yeah. There's also a Halloween party that takes place each year at the castle. Oh, fun. Right? With a special nighttime tour, DJ set, lights, bar. Oh, sorry. There's a DJ set, lights, and a bar in the Royal Park and a Halloween dinner at Queen Marie's Tea House. (gasps) I want to go. I know. From what I can find, it seems like this is a recurring event each year. That's cool. I to go. So, the, Kate, that is Braun Castle, the history of Dracula, Vlad Tepish, and its use in popular culture, media, and Hollywood movies. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's quite no, all that history. There's a lot of history in there. That's cool. Great. Have you... <laughs> I was trying to think of a segue, but I can't Have think of one. Have you ever seen a Dracula? <laughs> Have you ever been haunted by a Stragoi? Stragoi. <laughs> um, if so, let us know. Let us know. <laughs> Um, before we before we wrap up, I do want to say so we we put the video of the goat on Patreon, yeah. and we're getting some great new suggestions. Are we suggestions. really? Oh, I'll have to look today. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, so keep them coming, Patronians. Give us your suggestions on what we should name the goat, and then in like I don't know a few days or a week or so, whenever we're gonna put it out to all the listeners, and they're gonna vote on three. So yeah, uh, you can leave your thoughts your comments your hopes your dreams your ghost stories in the comments at no what's the thing on facebook facebook instagram and youtube yep that's it horrorwood podcast sometimes when i start to try to make a segue it doesn't you know i understand more than anyone and then i think like what did we say here uh you can also email us at horrorwoodpodcast at gmail.com or you could be like Alien Shade and Live Bork and hop on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash horrorwood podcast. Thanks, everybody. Oh, oh, oh. The children of the night.